So uh, yeah, I'm uh, Shreyas Cholia. I work here at Lawrence Berkeley Lab. Uh, split my time between NERSC and the Computational Research Division. And so a lot of what I do, working with the Jupiter Hub deployment here at NERSC, but also working with uh, various science use cases on getting Jupiter integrated with uh, bigger workflows, among other things. So um, what I'm going to talk about is just how we're trying to use Jupiter to enable distributed computing using things like IPy Parallel to control um, bigger jobs that are running on an HPC cluster on the back end. Um, and so this was originally had a, a use case that was uh, out of the Atlas uh, LHC detector um, where they wanted to do some distributed deep learning using convolutional neural networks to be able to classify some of these images coming out of the detector. Um, and so without getting into the details, yeah, the idea is to be able to use Jupyter um, to, do a, to solve a couple of these classes of problems. Um, so why interactive distributed deep learning? Um, I think for a lot of projects, this is kind of the next frontier in terms of being able to enable scientific discovery. Um, typically, take a while to train these networks and you're you know, doing a lot of tuning and figuring out all the parameters and hyperparameters that go into a model. Um, there's a lot of brute force scans and optimized uh, automated optimization. Um, and then our batch HPC systems have their own wait times and slow iteration cycles. Um, combine this with the fact that a lot of the new uh, deep learning frameworks are Python based, so you know things like Keras and TensorFlow. Um, I think using Jupyter notebooks as uh, or Jupyter as a whole as the environment to be able to manage these things made a lot of sense. Um, so for this uh, demo, this was part of an LDRD, um, and then we presented this work at the ISC uh, Interactive Computing Workshop. Um, so for this. We Used a bunch of things to get all this to work together. So we ended up using IPy Parallel to manage the tasks on the back end. Um, we're using QGrid on a Quantopian to render the, the inter an interactive table that you could use to flip through. And you'll, you'll see a couple of movies in a second. Um, EQplot from Bloomberg was really useful to be able to do visualization. And then we wrote this little thing called Kale that would let you have fine-grained control over the tasks themselves. And so if you wanted to issue starts and stops and changing the parameters, Kale would just wrap your individual tasks. Um, and then you could basically control those through the service. Um, all right, so here's a little bit about how we set all this stuff up. So at NERSC, we have a Jupyter Hub web server that um, basically lets you spin up a, and there, there's other modes, all of will go into a lot more detail on the various other ways you can do Jupyter Notebooks at NERSC, but for this particular effort, we're spinning up a notebook on a, a the equivalent of a login node, so it's got a lot of memory, it's got a lot of CPU, and it's, it's a shared resource, but we can spin up a lot of notebooks on there. So you spin up the notebook server process on here, you start up the kernel, which runs the IPy parallel um, client, and then you bring up um, a bunch of backend nodes on the compute side. Uh, we had a little magic called IP cluster that would let you do that. So you just give it a few parameters and it spins everything up and calls numbers for you. And it lets you set up all of these nodes, which you can then control using IPy parallel. Because we're using IPy Parallel, they also gave us the ability to use um, MPI on the back end. Um, we did play around with Dask as well, but in the end, partly because we knew it better, but also because there were a couple of little tunable things we could do in IPy Parallel, we, we ended up using that. Um, that said, Dask is probably better supported, and if, if you know, there's a way to do this in Dask moving forward, that would be interesting. Um, and so, yeah, this is basically just a couple of screenshots for how we set this thing up. So, you know, you just describe your job, pass it into this magic, um, bring up an IPy parallel client, which connects to the cluster on the back end. So it's just connecting to these workers and you're off and running. 
Um, and so we did two kinds of things. There was this distributed training, which was basically just, you know, go off and do your training. And we use a tool called Harvard, which is out of Uber, I want to say. Um, and I think they do, uh, they basically provide you with a bunch of primitives to do um, deep learning backend. And they actually use MPI under the covers. And so if you look at their primitives, you'll see things like hvd.rank and, and whatnot. So you can actually, um, you know, it, it combines this MPI world um, with a more, you know, deep learning training model world. Um, and then we noticed that we could actually just use IPyPyL to start the workers and then use Harvard to do all the communication between those. And there was really no overhead in terms of the infrastructure. All right, so that was maybe not quite interactive. It was, you know, you're using the all this stuff, the more version of this was for doing hyperparameter optimization. Um, and so this actually involves setting up these workers and then trying to optimize for hyperparameters across a bunch of different uh, possible models that you're trying to use. And so what we're doing is running each task separately and then seeing which ones, which tasks are doing better. Uh, so you can get the loss um, and the accuracy. You can sort through what's going on. Um, and then, so, so it's a lot more interactive. You'll see from this short little movie we have here. Um, but, ah, I went. Uh, no. Hang on. I think I can play this. All right, I have a movie on my, I have it locally. I'll just play it off of here. HBO movie fast, yeah. All right, so this will, um, all right, and so the idea here is that you're basically running this across a space of hyperparameters, which you can see um, down over here. Um, so you've got a bunch of different values that you're trying out. You can flip through and see which um, models are doing better, which ones are not. You can sort based on the things you care about. So if you want to sort on the best model based on validation loss or accuracy or loss, or you can do that. Um, so it's a nice way of running, stu running stuff in real time, getting those results and then actually being able to do things like, um, you know, stop and start things in case that things are more um, promising than others and actually have a second movie there, which I actually work out of here. Um, yeah, so this is the other, the, 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 the second little video where it's the same thing. This, this was a little bit of a, more of a toy problem because it was easier to capture a short film with this where we're actually starting and stopping jobs. Um, but yeah, so you're here, you're actually stopping something that didn't quite and, and you can go in and do things like tweak the parameters that you're running against. So let me see if I have an example of that. Um, you, know, you can also get resource monitoring under the covers. Um, And yeah, you can change the parameters that you're passing, the hyperparameters that you're running the job with. So you're stopping a job, redefining those hyperparameters and starting it up again. So it's, it's, it's a nice way to do sort of interactive training. Um, and all the setup and the, the pre and post analysis happens as a Jupyter notebook. So it's not just a one-off widget thing, it actually fits into a larger workflow. All right. Um, so we're using the same approach with the National Center for Electron Microscopy, where we're looking at a bunch of these images. Um, there, it's, it's a thing called Pi 40 STEM, which takes these two-dimensional images, and then you can explore each pixel in that 2D image, and that gives you an, another two dimensions, and that's where the 4D comes from. Um, and they had this series in a Jupyter notebook to do all their analyses, and then we basically just put these hooks on the back end and allowed them to spread their tasks um, out on an HPC cluster and we got a much, a, a really nice speed up there. Um, all right, so this was extra slides. Since we actually have some time, I'll kind of walk through some of this stuff and this might feed, seed other topics um, later in this, uh, in this workshop. 
So we're also doing, working with uh, Dan Allen from NSS, and we're talking about doing curated known notebook environments where the idea is that you can browse these curated notebook environments using things like NB Viewer, close launch into the user's workspace with the appropriate Conda environment, and now you have reproduced learning notebooks. So in some sense, it's a lot like Binder, but it's in, inside the HPC world where you don't have um, Binder like backend, and really all you're trying to do is copy a notebook over, send it over, send it off with the appropriate. Um, you want to be able to look at things easily, and then create a copy in your workspace with the appropriate kernel. I think that's kind of the thing that we've been, the request we've been getting from users. So, um, but I think we're still very much in the prototyping and experimenting phase of that, but and so it'll be useful to see what other people are thinking in the space as well. Um, we're also playing with uh, paper mill from Netflix to do this par parameterized notebook thing where people want to run against different data sets and they just want to capture everything as a notebook. Um, people want to capture parameters, so we're playing around with that. Um, we've got a couple of Jupyter Lab extensions that uh, we have some students looking at. So the Slurm extension lets you manage things and you. Know, you you can basically bring up Slurm as, a, as an extension in Jupyter Lab and um, start jobs, submit jobs, um, release, kill, do things with that. I think somebody had a request for something like this um, in the, the discourse. And then we also have a res resource usage monitoring extension, which is basically the NB res use thing that we talk about. Um, and we just have a little, like, a couple of graphs that lets you display that. All right. And that's all I have.